Hello everyone, it's Dmitry Anoshin and Surfalytics. And today we will talk about how we can connect the databases. This is the second lesson of the Model 2 about database. The database is probably the most important thing in data analytics. I think like 90% of data analytics happening in databases. Of course now it's shift more towards Clakehouse, big data solution that we talk model, starting probably model 7, then we'll talk about Apache Spark and then uh, also model 6 about, then we'll talk about analytics data warehouse. So, but most of the things, especially then you consider to be a role as a data analyst or BI engineer, but this is the role that using most of the time the database, the query. And even in some extensions, in some examples, those roles will using the SQL query. And even if they want to query data lake or they want to query lake house, they will still feel that they're querying the databases. So it doesn't matter what kind of architecture you have, if it has the interface that you can connect and then start querying, then the, probably this, the only thing you should care about. So in this lesson, we'll see how we can connect databases. We'll do some hands-on and also practice a bit on the SQL. And then I show a couple of the most popular resources that you can start learning SQL. Assuming you starting work in an organization and this organization have the databases. There could be different databases, as you know, where it's like could be OLTP databases, there could be data warehouses. And if we like the role of data warehouses, like consolidate all the data, maybe you have a bunch of source application databases, the data somehow coming to data warehouse. And then as an analyst or BI engineer, you can connect this database, just writing the SQL query, you can connect with BI, maybe even you can use the Python, for example, the most popular library SQL Alhemi. And still, most of the case, it's just plain SQL. So I don't want to talk about now how, how the data is coming to data warehouse, how we transform this. We'll spend dedicated model four about uh, ETL and ETL patterns, what's different ETL from LT. In the model three, we'll talk about BIs. And even by the end of this model two, we actually will create the cloud analytic solution using the cloud instance of database, relational database, and then maybe some free offering for BI tool. We'll load the data about Superstore that we used in the first model, and we'll try to query this. On this slide, I, I just show you as example, assuming you use your databases, and it could be Postgres, because the Postgres is one of the most popular. It could be source application database, it could be data warehouse, if you don't have the big data volume, and then you can use any BI tool to establish connection or the query. Even if we're using different ETL tools, in many cases, they still need to establish the connection. Even very frequently, machine learning teams, then for example, they want to build their pipelines, machine learning pipelines using AI, generative AI, they still need to connect the database. And for example, recently, I had examples, the machine learning team using GDBC drivers, and we'll talk about more, what is it soon? They use GDBC driver and Jupyter Notebooks. And again, we will learn what is Jupyter Notebooks. Even we will learn what is SageMaker down the road. And they're using SageMaker and the Jupyter Notebooks to pull the data from Snowflake Data Warehouse and we'll cover the Snowflake in detail on the Model 6 as one of the most popular data warehouse. But for you here, you just need to focus how you're gonna connect the database. It could be Snowflake, uh, it could be BigQuery, it could be Postgres, MySQL, SQL Server, doesn't matter. Because the pattern is still the same. So the one, only one thing you need to understand is the pattern. The database available, you establish connection, you start to query the data and explore the data. The most popular thing to connect databases for many years, maybe decades, is the SQL client. And for our purpose, we will use the free SQL client that calls dbweaver. It has community edition, it's totally free. There are different alternatives, for example, for SQL servers exist management studio that probably can connect different databases apart from SQL server. There are also some other alternatives, even for CLI. Some people can use CLI like 
through you know, DevOps system admins, they can use CLI to query the databases or different CLI clients. Some people can use the Python, as I mentioned, like SQL Alhemia library to establish kind of databases and submit SQL queries. For the special reason, I don't want to touch any coding, any, any Python or any other coding languages just to do not make things complicated. Because you might hear, you might hear that Python and SQL are the most popular language for working with data. And in most of the cases, if you work with relational databases or data warehouse, you actually don't need Python. You can use the SQL and the SQL would be enough to query the data and answer the business questions. So this is your goal, as you remember. You as a data analyst, BI engineer, you should provide value for the business. And to provide the value for business, we need to look to the data. And to look to the data and explore the data, we can use SQL. That's why one of the most important skill for you is the SQL. So you need the master SQL. And if you can use ChatGPT, to write your Python or understand the Python, create the functions, or maybe decode the old code, ChatGPT can do it pretty well. But still right now, as of today, the ChatGPT not able to provide very good SQL query. But the pattern is simple, the data structure is simple, but still somehow it have hard time to actually write the proper SQL query. Then we have subqueries, uh, then we have maybe complex window functions. Usually result is different. Okay, on this screen we have SQL client debeaver and also example of CLI. I think this is uh, for Postgres application. Then we want to connect to the database and we'll do this uh, in debeaver. We want to use a GDBC driver connection if it's non-Windows application or maybe the database doesn't support a DBC driver or very often on the Windows machine, especially when you connect to SQL Server and some other database and data warehouses, you can use ODBC driver. So ODBC stands for Open Database Connectivity, standard interface between database and application interactive. GDBC is Java Database Connectivity, Java application interface for interacting with database. So the very first thing that you need, if you want to connect database, make sure that you have drivers. And usually it's uh, on the Windows machine, just download and install it like any other application. For non-Windows machine like macOS, Linux, you need to download GDBC drivers as the jar files. And for example, dbeaver is smart enough that it can pull, depends on the connection you're gonna create, it can pull the drivers from the internet and install for you. Also, you can notice the drivers, they have the version, and it's good practice to always keep the most recent version. For example, you, you join the organization and you have the first assignment to write the query to calculate the sales by region. And the first question you should ask, how I can connect the data? And by this, we mean what database exactly, right? Do we use databases or maybe some kind of other applications? We have, uh, I don't know, Salesforce or any other systems that you can pull the data and generate report, download on CSV, and then use the spreadsheets to analyze the data. So, if they're using database, either for application database or data warehouse, then probably you need to understand what, what vendor of database. So the three the most popular among application database, MySQL, Postgres SQL Server, but there are a bunch of different databases uh, that serve analytical for analytical data warehouse purpose. But the connection procedure all is the same. So then Another thing that very frequently happening in big organization, that assuming you have the database, you have username, you have credentials, host, port, everything you need to connect, but the connection doesn't work. And one of the issue could be due to firewall. So the next, if for example, if you're getting error about timeout, it means you just hit the firewall and your IP address from your home computer or maybe from your computer doesn't allow to connect the database. So if it's timeout error, then you should ask, check about networking and firewall. So then of course, login and password you need to have. And there are, login and password is the most, uh, the simplest authentication uh, method, but there are, exist many more. For example, some organization, big enterprise company, they can use Okta for using for authentication. 
another good practice, for example, using MFA. So you have login and password, and to enforce security, uh, you can enable MFA. Uh, there is also very popular, especially in, in SQL Server, is using Azure ID account. So there are different ways how you can connect, but very frequently and the simple way, just using password and uh, username. And the good practice, never, never sharing your password, never sharing it via Slack, via emails, because the password should be secure. Another good practice, we should rotate password every 90 days. And then depends what tool we use and what we want to connect to our database. It could be ETL tool, it could be BI tool, it could be SQL client. We need to download the proper driver. Then finally, we can enter all credentials, server port, database name, user and password, and click test connection and should succeed. By the way, another popular method for connection, especially between, for example, your BI application and the data warehouse, it's using key pair. And the key pair is the private key and public key that you can generate and assign to your connection. What's the key SQL operations? First, we'll uh, look to DDL, data definition language, and, and this is language that basically have the commands to create tables, create the views, drop table, truncate the table, truncate the table, it's like just uh, erase everything from the table. Uh, they're very popular, especially when we work with big data, is a data engineer or analyst. If one, you have some SQL logic and we want to create another table on top of the SQL logic, we can use just create table select, also known as CTAS. Then there is another type of the SQL query, it's DML, data manipulation language. So the commands like insert into, uh, it means we can just insert one, rec one row in the table, or we can do the bulk insert, for example, insert into, into, and then provide the select statement that we want to insert on the table. We also can do delete operation and update operation. So those operations, especially delete and update, they're quite slow. Insert, the slow as well. And in the model four, then we'll talk about ETL and ELT. We'll learn why insert into a single row is slow, and you even will run the test trying to insert in the cloud data warehouse, and then do the same with using like the bulk load or copy command in the cloud data warehouse, and see how the dramatically the speed of loading is different. And then the most popular that you're going to use is data query language. So you can see there are select from where group by having order by there are several joins union subquery sql function and recent years especially people who are gonna use dbt and you'll learn about dbt on the model 4 ct right it's the same as subquery but all your logic is above if subquery is usually under the ct is above and this is the most common way of writing query nowadays so all what you need to do you need to learn some examples of using those keywords, understand what they means. And then if someone will show you, because I probably 95% of interviews, they're gonna assess your SQL knowledge. So that's why the only single thing you need to know really well is the SQL. And to know SQL well, you need to practice a lot. And you need to practice till the moment, for example, if, if someone print you paper, there will be like two tables, 10 rows each, and you ask some questions, then you need to take pen and paper and write SQL down. This is how you should know and understand the SQL. And as you know, already we especially spend some time on the model one on spreadsheets because you, you're gonna operate with the data in the same way. So there is uh, columns, rows, and, uh, and tables as sheets, right? So everything the same as a spreadsheet. So even if it will be helpful for you, you can have like, for example, two sheets of data, 10 records each in spreadsheet, trying to join, manipulate it, calculate different things, and then upload the same 10 rows into two different tables in database, and then write the query and match the result results. So just to understand how it works. So the SQL joins, there are multiple joins, uh, inner join, full join, left join, right join. So the most popular are inner join and left join. So if you have 10 tables or if you have two tables and you want to join them together, so inner join and you have maybe customer ID in the customer tables, you have maybe 
shipping table with shipping address, shipping details, and it has customer ID. So you have uh, 20 customers and you have uh, 10 shipping records. So if you will do the inner join, it means you only return 10 records because I assume one customer have one shipping. And if in shipping table you don't have customer ID, it will basically not removing it. And this inner join. So inner join is a quite good practice. It's like ideal world. Then you confident your data have good quality and you don't miss any records. You don't have any issue with data. So inner join is perfect. But in real world, our tables often can have missing um, IDs, missing dimensions, missing data, some issue of data quality. That's why the most common pattern is using left turn. So in our case, if we have 20 customer IDs in left table, right, and it's left join because the left table, first table we put, right, and then what we connect table, right, that we're using to connection, it has 10 records, we still return 20 customer IDs because it will return everything from the first table, left table, and then if something uh, mapping to the OCD, it will returning as well. So the right join is opposite. In some cases, not frequently, you, you might use full join. So basically, if there is some overlapping, you doesn't matter, you return all, everything. But in analytics use case, it's uh, not popular. There is also one more join exists. It's Cartesian cross join. And for example, if you just say you want join table A and table B, and you won't specify the join condition. So it, it will run the cross join and basically multiply each record from one table on all records to another table. So it's just kind of like big blow up for your data, for your records, and it's usually very hard for performance of database. So try to avoid the cross join Cartesian products, just focusing either inner join or left join depends on the quality. That's it about what I want to tell you. Just have two slides about the SQL. And this is probably the old theory you need to know. And you can learn SQL just by, by theory. You actually need to do the practice. So now we can do some exercises. First of all, I will show you a Debeaver website, community edition. So here you can download the Beaver, right? You can use for Windows, for Mac OS, for Linux, and I already have one. I have the Beaver. It's probably, you see, like from Christmas, the first time I installed it and never updated. The first time I start the Beaver, it asked me, do I want to, oh no, it ask send statistics. But first time you will start the Beaver, it will ask you, do you want to actually get the sample data? And it might be very helpful, but there is uh, different ways to get the sample database. We can create the sample database from here. We'll see we instantly have the database. So it's using SQLite. What is SQLite? It's basically a database that, small database that just a file. And it's good, for example, using this database for training purpose, or maybe sometimes you can get assignments, even then I remember my time at Amazon, then I had enter you. I just got a SQLite database about some music and artists that I need to provide some basic queries to answer some questions. So what I have here, the, the first time I'm starting trying to connect this database, it's allowing the Beaver allows me to download the drivers, GDBC drivers. And you already know that drivers is, the, is very important. Without drivers, we couldn't connect the database. So I downloading it. Here I have the tables. And uh, this is what we have. We can see, we can actually explore what it have. We have just tables. Uh, we can also may have views. Right, and here we can table have the columns and the columns have the data types. So every database might have slightly different types, but for example, integer uh, is quite common. So probably around well, um, 10 different data types, but you either have numeric information or you have uh, string kind of information, or right, different types. So that's of course good to know what kind of data types you have. 
What I can also see here, if I click twice, I can get sample of data. So this is the sample of data. I can export this data in CSV. Um, I have entity relationship diagram even here, and it can tell me the joints between album, artist, and track. Next lesson we'll spend on data modeling in databases. This is quite frequent questions about data modeling. That's why it could be useful for you. This is what we have. Now, the next thing that is important for this lesson, I already pre-uploaded into GitHub. It is here, right? It's a Shrivality course where I upload all resources for the course. And here we have uh, the model two, getting started with databases. And here I uploaded information that might be helpful for you. As usual, what we can do, if you watch the model zero, you should know how to work with Git. And ideally, everything you do, you should commit to the Git, just practice it daily. And this is, will be your big advantage. So what we can do, I clean code, can get HTTPS, and then make an open terminal. I can see where I am now. Serifolytics, I can see, do I have any Git folder? I have Git folder. I can go to GitHub. I can see what I have here. I have another repo. Now I can add one more. If I will type git clone and then URL, I can download everything on my machine. Now, if I go to analytics uh, course, then if then we stop ID also model zero, I can use the code dot. Visual code should open this location. We see it's open this location, everything here. I can start the new terminal. I'm using all my Z shell. And this is, if you watch already model zero, then you probably have the similar setup as myself. I don't want to update this. This is what we have. And this is everything we need for this lesson. I have readme file. I don't, do we have markdown preview? Yeah, I have markdown preview. We already got the SQL client to download the beaver. We explore databases. And the next thing, we can try install database locally and we'll use one of the most popular Postgres. That's free open source databases. We can download it from here. And of course, for your operational system, then we can try to put this into application. I already ha have one because I already practice, but I can click place. It asks my permissions to do so. It was faster to know from internet or then just overwrite the file in the folder. We'll see how it goes. It's almost done. And then uh, we'll using the beaver to connect the Postgres. But before we need to make sure that we start Postgres up and it's running. If I go to application folder, uh, maybe not like here. I go here. And then I found what I want to find. I want to find the Postgres app. And start it. See how it goes. It asked me to initialize it. We can set, see the server settings. It probably have the default password. It also have automatic start. So let's try to initialize this. It tells me the port is already in use because I might run uh, the Postgres on this machine under another user, so the port is busy. That's good. Maybe it's even good that we see these, these kind of things. And we can change the port to maybe 5434. And usually every database vendor, they have their default port. Let's try to initialize for this port. And now we have uh, Postgres database, we have Serfolytics database, the same as my user in the computer and template database. So what we want to do, uh, first I'm trying to see here, if I click, it opens CLI, 
and it is ready to accept connections and do anything. We can see here it's using uh, Postgres username and probably the same Postgres password. Let's do the same in here. We're gonna create new connection. We use Postgres and localhost. We change the port. Postgres, Postgres, and probably the password is also Postgres. Let's click test connection. It's one to download. Okay, let's download the drivers. We pass the test. And now we have one more connection. This is my database. Here I can create uh, the new SQL script. Here we have what I am connecting, what kind of database I'm connecting. In DBviewer, there are lots of preference that you can set line numbers, you can choose the colors, you can see how the SQL is formatting, it's very nice. Another thing I didn't show you that's very helpful often, here I can generate select statement query and just copy paste it to save some time. I can run this. Oh yeah, because I don't need to run it here, I need to have uh, the SQL editor for SQLite. We can see it's here. We can also try to generate insert statement if we want to insert some records, right? And then we can just what we want to insert here. And we can also generate the DDL. Let's see how the table is created. Basically everything you need to know is all here. We don't need to save it. Also it's very good to turn on auto save in DBR. By default it doesn't save your work. Let's go here and see, oh, we actually already cloned it. Let's see what else we need to do. So we can create the new table in Postgres. But first we need to actually create schema test. And it doesn't matter do we use capital letters or not capital. Create schema test. And you see by default it's uh, lowercase for me. Now I can create the table here and then I can insert something in my table. And this is what's happening under hood usually with all application databases. Somehow it's running some inserts. And that's the purpose of OLTP transaction database that it, for example, can do lots of inserts for seconds. It's not optimized for analytical queries. Now we can refresh it here, you can see the schema, we have schema test, we have the table, it's 16 kilobyte size, you can click it twice and we see there is a single record. This is what we did. Next step, what we want to do, uh, yeah, we can select from the table or we can just use simple think that it's just click twice on database. Now, the next thing is more interesting because I also encourage you using CLI, Git, and the Docker containers because very often I see that Docker and containers quite often running in different organizations. And for you, it's really great advantage to know what's the container. That's why for most of the labs, I want to practice on the container as well. What we're gonna do, and here I already create the Docker file for you. It is using the latest Postgres image. And then what we do, we also pass the environment variables. You should know what's environment variables. It's the part of CLI. And this is how usually secrets are sharing. Then for example, you're running uh, some local development and you want to leverage the passwords. It's through environment variables. Here I pass the, the passwords. It's not a very secure way to do. There is different ways how you can do run securing, maybe storing it somewhere in, for example, GitHub secrets, or maybe in the cloud secret storage, or maybe in one password vault, and some different options, and then you can just pull this secretly. Then I copy my CSV file. As a CSV file, I have three files that we use for analyzing in the model one. And this is my general approach. I want to use the same files over and over. Basically, I will take those files 
and we'll clone those files uh, into database and do the insert. We just want to copy this on the container and we want to copy also files from, from here, from this folder. And I have here two SQL files. You already should know what is this. We create schema uh, just in case we drop table if it exists. Uh, to not get there, you know, somehow table already exists in container and we run it for the second time. So then we want to create the table. We're creating a table. We want to use the copy command. Uh, it's the different from insert. They insert records by records. Here you basically do bulk insert for the whole file into the table and just specify the path to the file, your delimiter, and this is CSV and has header. For each file, so we push it in all tables. So it works in the way then we start the Postgres. So we're running the Docker container. The first thing it does, it's basically going to this directory, executing those SQL queries. We also can expose the port. The port that we want to exco expose for Postgres in container, just like default port, it can be default port 5432. We, not, we won't be able to access this from my local machine because already my ports 5432 uh, is busy, 5434 is busy. So we will reassign this and make sure that our Postgres continue to running, not just like creating tables and shut down. We will use CMD Postgres to make sure that Postgres server is still up and running. For this, I probably need to start the Docker container Oh, not docker connect, docker app. And the docker app has docker diamond. Okay, I have it here. Now I can check what kind of commands I need to run. Here I have the docker run command. In my case, because if, for example, if you don't have port 5433 busy, you can do this. But first thing we need to do, we need actually create the docker image. And for example, in this case, I forgot what command I need to use. And the simplest way to find what kind of things I need to use, I can go just to chat GPT and say, okay, I forgot the command and I have this Docker file. I can say, I have this thing, right? I already have those thing and I, it's very good to show you how I can use chat GPT in my work to help me. And I say, I forgot what command to run to build the image because we know the first thing we build the image and the second we start the container to build the image and uh, see the list of images and then start my container. And it's trying to see this, okay? So it's simple docker build, dash t, it means we're using the alias and then we can see a list of Docker images available for me. You know, the image is a snapshot, right? And then we can create running container. We can shut down this in time. We can copy any number of containers. And these commands will, will do this. And it also tells us it using dash D because uh, it will running in detach mode. Basically, my CLI will be still available for me. Let's just do this. So uh, it didn't work. And you know, you should know why it's not work because I'm running this not from directory that I have Docker file. In this case, I need to provide my directory with my Docker file. I can say my Docker file is here. Can I pass this? And using another flag, dash F, to basically to specify location. Okay, let's try to do this. Now it's doing the job. And it telling me it couldn't do the copy command because it's trying to look the same route. So to avoid any confusion, we can simply go and cd to this folder. We can see go to connecting database. Here we have the Docker file, and then we can execute this command. So to avoid any confusion. So we see what it's doing, it's downloading different things, it's copy everything. So now we can see my list of images and I see the Postgres image. The same, I can go here 
and see a list of my positive images. So it's pretty big size, right? Uh, but probably the same size if we have a uh, Postgres application. So uh, the next step, we can execute the command to connect, not connect to start the container. And we just need to make sure that this port will be free for us. So here we have 5434. It means the port 5433 should be available for us. And this is ID of my container. And I can run the command docker ps and see container ID, image that it's using, status, it's up, and the port transferring. So, and also if I go to docker app, containers, I can see the green, and it means my container is run. So I can also go in here and uh, open a CLI. Where is it? Mm -hmm. uh, this doesn't need. So we can see what file systems we have. We see that we copy this thing, and we also somewhere might have the files. It's the files that we copy. Anyway, so our goal to check that files successfully loaded. That's why we can clone, uh, copy, paste, and I can edit this connection. So the only difference is the port, and then I can also rename it to Postgres Docker. And we can see, does it work? Yeah, it's successfully connected. Schemas, row, tables, and we have uh, three tables that we're gonna use for the future, for example, for BI model, for ETL model, we still work with the same. Even in the future, we'll do some DBT works, DBT data modeling, and we'll still use the same tables. So now I want to create SQL editor and just show you a couple commands for the SQL. So the simple one is using select. Even to avoid ink write, I can generate it here and I can select. So another useful command, usually then I do, we can check how many rows we have in the table. 8,000 rows, okay. Then another helpful command, I can see how many count distinct order ID I have in the table. And also I can add the alias as orders or maybe unique orders. And we can add comma and we can add more things to here. So I see this is number of units. And we can say, okay, we want to see how many records we have per order. And we can say just count star. If we do the aggregation function, then we should use the group by. We can use ID one or we can use order ID. So, and we see some free, and for example, if I want to discending order, I can add the order by one in discending. And this is, uh, yeah, but we want not by order ID discending, just using by, that's what we have. And we, at the same time, we want to add one more condition, actually, very frequent question on the interview if you want query by aggregated data. So we can have having count star more than five. So it basically should return only one, two rows. These are two orders, have says six records. And we can check what kind of records they have. So we can say where order ID because we have more than one order, we can say in. And because it's integer information, we don't need uh, any quotes. And we can see, we return everything. It's already ordered by the order ID. So we can see why does it, yeah, what kind we have. So the buy different product names, the price, and assuming we want to get to know how much money they spend and they can say order ID and then I want to use zoom just okay let's use quantity and you see the debeaver even highlight me uh, the column names and I click type I don't need to run as quantity and now I need to add the group by 
one. So the order of those keywords, I don't know why DB are sometimes using uh, capital, sometimes lower. Another thing in DB were, if I choose and here I can do formatting, I can use lowercase everything and I can also format SQL. Depends on the rules I have. So maybe it's more readable, right? Anyway, so if you're running this query. So for now, we're just focusing on single table without any joins. So because we have two other tables, like returns, and now we can practice the joins. So if I say select count distinct order ID from, and by the way, you need to repeat these, those commands and familiarize yourself with the idea. So we start very simple to more complicated. Uh, from table and you see the table, I usually specify the schema name and the table because there could be different schema names. Of course, we can use somewhere default schema name for our active session. Okay, uh, it's here. So this now. Now we will use inner join and we can also have all alias O and we'll use the table returns. Uh, and it's already put the alias, fine. And we can say all order ID equal, so this ID that we enjoy, uh, error order ID. And we'll see how many intersections they have. Oh, it's telling me that order ID exists in both tables and it's a bit confused. So that's why we can use this. So we see we now have 572, it means the, the same number of orders with returns. Okay, what the next thing, if we do right join, so it means we will return everything from returns and only what match from orders, the same. But if we do left join, it's everything from the left. We can do try full join and the same number because we don't have any orders that exist here and not exist in the main orders table. And you can stack the joins. If I want to join another table, I can just start left join and then say, for example, I want to join managers. Um, and I can say, for example, row managers on we see oh manager. So we don't have the manager ID, so I'm not sure why we, we're using the managers. We have region, right? We can join on the region, but that's the idea. So there, there are other things you need to check is uh, union, then what is CT, usually start with its statement, and also what else we have, there's several things. And the window function. Window functions I consider it like advanced SQL because all the functions I have like count star or sum, they're happening in the context what we return. But we also can change the context and that we can run the window function. So this is more advanced topic. So now let's check the couple of resources that are very helpful. One resource that I learned the SQL more than like almost 15 years ago, sqlx.ru. It has English version. So here you can register and it has SQL exercises or like over 100 exercises are very simple for each exercise is a study book. Uh, you can learn it. So maybe it's here, now it's still trying to ask me login. Uh, somewhere that it has, so basically register and start using this. It has like some schema about printers, some peripherals, computers, and you start writing queries from the one table, then join. And despite the fact it has like over 100 exercises, with like more complex, if you will solve like at least 30 exercises, you're good to go. So another one, Hacker Renka. SQL, it has SQL exercises, and it's a lot. So there is also mode SQL tutorial. They use, it's free and it has everything you need. I think just you can focus on this. And um, another thing, even if you work data analyst and BI developer and you will use BI tool to drag and drop things and create your semantic models and all the queries and BI tool will create uh, SQL query under hood, it's still important to know the concept and understand what's happening under hood. Because as I said, you can review, everyone will uh, check in your query. So we check this. I know the quite popular resource data Lemur. 
So it's good on the SQL. It has SQL exercises. Uh, the lead code is good. It has also SQL exercises, but not sure if they have free version. Also, one point of time I finish uh, because under the SQL it's relational algebra. So once I finish Cambridge University, it probably was Cambridge University SQL and database pre course. Maybe it was this, or uh, maybe it was Stanford. It was, uh, let's check, database the relational. Oh, it's um, who do we have the teacher? So we see it's free. I just want to see who is the teacher because I probably finish. You see, it's, it's free, but unfortunately, I don't see who is the teacher. I think I, then I studied this, I was studied here two weeks, and I think they have good coverage. Yeah, Jennifer, that was my teacher. Then I did this course many years ago. And after here, I start to use, instead of SQL, I start to use SQL, as she said. Um, you don't need certificate at all, anything at all, but all the courses is nice to have. So what you learn, you will understand uh, some extra topics. So this course, I definitely recommend to dive deep, but it's not important. The more important, just to practice, practice, practice. If you know work with SQL, maybe it takes you two months, three months to fully understand and master it. Just do it every day, at least 30 minutes. And maybe it's completely unclear when you start, but afterwards it will be very simple. So that's it. The next lesson will be data modeling and see you. And by the way, if you want to progress on your data career, you want to boost, then join our community on Surfalytics in Discord where we, we have the projects that support each other, we have interview, mock interviews, the SQL interviews, and a bunch of benefits that can boost your career and you can faster find the job across the, the globe. See you.